Good Tuesday morning, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and thank you kindly for joining us on the Jerry and Jerry Show, live in downtown Charlottesville, hop, skip, and a jump from the University of Virginia, a program that covers all Wahoo athletics, covers the Atlantic Coast Conference, and college sports across the board. We'll talk pro football today as well. Malik Washington, a six-round draft pick by the Miami Dolphins. His future is bright. I think he's just scratching the surface with his pro potential. I'll ask Jerry Hootie Ratcliffe, the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, about Malik Washington and what his thoughts were with the Miami Dolphins taking a guy that's pretty darn versatile on the football field, guys. We'll talk basketball. In fact, that's what we're going to lead with. The transfer portal, unfortunately, crickets and silence from a commitment standpoint for Tony Bennett's basketball team. The only team in the Atlantic Coast Conference without a transfer portal commitment, the one right here in Charlottesville. And of course, we'll talk with Tony Elliott in college football. As we head from spring football into the dog days of summer, all eyes under center with Anthony Calandria and Tony Musket, both fellas looking pretty healthy and capable right now for a Virginia football team that has some bright spots, but could go as far as that offensive line goes. Um, on the gridiron. We'll talk about that, all those storylines and more. Judah Wickhauer, the director and producer. Judah, if you can go to the studio camera and then a two shot to welcome the star of the show, Jerry Hootie Ratcliffe, my friend, one day removed from May in 2024. Yeah, that's uh, April seemed to fly by, didn't it? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, somewhat surprising that Virginia hasn't been able to land anyone in the portal. Um, I think you hit upon something when you mentioned a lot of negative recruiting and you know a lot of the coaches out there going after the same players as Virginia probably didn't have to uh, negative recruit as hard as they might have wanted to do because the national media did it for them during the before the tournament started and during the tournament and after the tournament uh, just continued to rip. Virginia's uh, lackluster offense, and I think that gave a lot of rival coaches all the ammunition they needed for if they were going up Virginia for recruiting in, in high school situations or the transfer portal, and it's something that uh, Tony Bennett's going to have to take a, some kind of a fire extinguisher to try to put out a little little fires all over the place. Uh, Virginia fans, let us know your thoughts on the transfer portal. Put them on the social media platform. You're watching this show upon, and will we re relay it live on air? The old ball coach watching on your Twitter account, uh, he highlights Coach Tony Bennett had a get-out-of-jail pass with the tw uh, 2019 National Championship, uh, the, 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 the championship, the Who's won. Uh, but the old ball coach says if he does not sign St. Anne's Belfield star Chance Mallory like Mox was able to get with the St. Anne's uh, star Mo, then how will this hall pass, how long will it last for? Uh, Chance Mallory is the talk of Charlottesville. I will highlight with Chance Mallory, he's got a significant upside, hell of a point guard, hell of a score, finishes around the rim. Not the tallest guy on the hardwood, Chance Mallory, but he is a local right. fella. Yeah, I think he's 5'9", is that correct? Yeah. Um, yeah, he's a terrific player, and uh, a lot of a lot of really big-time programs are after him. Uh, you would think Virginia would be favored uh, to get a hometown guy, but the, sometimes that works against you because I've seen this happen in – various sports throughout my career is that a lot of kids don't want to sign where they grew up. They they want to get away from home um, for whatever reason and experience a new city, a new situation, a new... Very understandable. You know, and it happens a lot. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think that's an, a given that he's going to come to Virginia for those very reasons. I don't think it's anything against Virginia, but uh, um, I don't think that makes or breaks Virginia's basketball program. But uh, he certainly would be a great guy to have in the fold, no question about it. What – the only team in the Atlantic Coast Conference without a transfer portal commitment. What's going on here? I think it's a, a combination of things. I think 
at least one occasion, um, one of the players' credits did not transfer. Uh, UVA didn't accept some of his credits, and he signed uh, apparently with, or is going to sign with Wisconsin. Um, that was the uh, Amos kid that I think I'm pretty sure he visited, a 6 8 forward from uh, Northern Illinois. And then uh, I think a, in a couple of instances, it, uh, guys got swept away by NIL, and it's, and it's not to say that Virginia didn't offer them an attractive package. Uh, I think they just probably were given a, a maybe a better package somewhere else. And even though Virginia has a, a well, I'm told, has a pretty good NIL going for it now, that they've gotten more people and more money involved. Um, they're not going to get into bidding wars for players. It's just not their style. And, um, you know, I, I just think uh, that that's part of it. And, and in, in the case of the uh, Mahaney kid, the really good guard from St. Mary's who committed to UConn, uh, I mean, that's pretty much a no-brainer. If you're a guy who can score... Um, this could be a Cam Spencer <laughs> clone. My wife's a UConn yeah. graduate. Um, yeah. She's watching the program right here. Cam Spencer, what, played at Rutgers, mm -hmm. sort of U UMBC, Maryland, Baltimore County. Right. Transferred into UConn, won a national championship, and won, was one of the key components for Dan Hurley's team getting a repeat championship. Exactly. And, uh, you know, who... Who wouldn't want to go play for the two-time national champions? Uh, I, the hottest know, team in basketball. You and I were talking about it off the air. Danny Hurley's done an incredible job building that program, and uh, he looks like a genius the way he's constructed uh, the, the, that program and, and everything around it. And uh, you talk about NIL. They, <laughs> they have one of the best NILs around. And... Um, I mean, gosh, uh, he, he could be building a dynasty up there. I mean, nobody's been able to stop him in two years, and they're reloading big time in the portal. They've they've gotten some really good players uh, through the portal in the last week and a half, and uh, who knows? I, yeah, I would imagine they'd be the favorites in the country to to three peat. Yeah, uh, I would. UConn is is is. Absolutely, guys, loaded. And you talk about utilizing the portal to your benefit. Cam Spencer, um, I mentioned, he was a transfer from Rutgers. Um, he was also a transfer. He, he, he started his career, guys, excuse me, at, at Loyola, Maryland. I called it Baltimore County, Maryland. But he went from there to Rutgers to UConn. Even the star player for UConn last year, um, Newton, he wore number two. He came from ECU. Um, so Hurley knows the portal, and that's basketball now. Virginia, I'll highlight this again before I get to the comments I see coming on, and I'm starting to see the panic from the, the viewers and listeners. The only team in the Atlantic Coast Conference without a portal commitment. Remember, they lost Dante Harris to the portal. They lost Leon Bond to the portal. Mm -hmm. They're having to replace Ryan Dunn, who's in the NBA draft, Reese Beekman, who's in the NBA draft, um, Jordan Minor has exhausted his eligibility. Groves has exhausted his eligibility. Tane Murray returns, but he's probably best suited as a bench player. Uh, Eli Gertrude returns. Right now, he's looking like a potential starter at the three, potentially. Christian Bliss, you hope you see leaps and bounds um, from a redshirt freshman to looking like he's the potential starting point guard. Isaac McNeely at the two. But you have glaring holes in the front court. Yeah, no question about it. And uh, it's not like that they're done in the portal. I mean, there's still, last time I checked, there was uh, over 1,700 people in the portal. So there's still guys there that may not be top 100 uh, players in, in the portal, but they're still uh Guys, like you mentioned, that Hurley put on his team from uh, programs that weren't considered powerhouses, and they were, were still nice pieces that fit 
into his scheme. And uh, Virginia has, since just yesterday, uh, reached out to uh, another guy in the portal, um, a guy from San Diego State, a sophomore, 6'8 forward, Elijah Saunders, who averaged uh, six points and started 21 games for the Aztecs uh, last year. He's already heard from, like, he just entered the portal yesterday and has already heard from, from like, ten different schools. Um, so, you know, there's still still plenty of time. Uh, I don't think Virginia is probably panicking, but uh, it hasn't worked out like they had hoped it would. Uh, still no word from Trent Perry, the McDonald's All-American point guard who... Southern California transfer. As far as we know... Uh, He's the only Virginia's the only school he's visited and has no other visits planned that that has been publicized. Uh, he might be going to Gonzaga. I think they have reached out, but you know there there's still some guys out there that could. Oh, Ch Trent Perry would be the cherry on the Sunday. Oh, no question. I mean, Trent Perry would make this conversation have a completely different tone. You. Virginia's only had a couple of Burger Boys, as they say, in in, uh, in their program history. And Kyle Guy, the last one. Kyle Guy is the last one. Uh, he's rated higher than Kyle Guy was coming out of high school. So uh, he would be the highest ranked guy that, of the Tony Bennett era, should they be fortunate enough to get him. Um there, there's, uh, and, and, you know, it's not like the program, even though they, they've lost six guys, it's not like the program is bankrupt. They've got, like you mentioned, Christian Bliss, who I thought was a really good recruit last year. And um, I, I think, you know, had they needed him, I, th I think he could have played last year. He's, he's that good. And... The uh, Robinson kid, uh, he's had a year to mature in the program. He's 6'10", can give him a little bit of physicality up front. Uh, Jacob Kofi, the 6'9 guy from Seattle, I think is going to be uh, a, a force inside. Uh, certainly he's got a lot to learn coming right out of high school, but he's a physical kid. I think he's probably somebody that's going to be ready to play as a freshman. And then you've got uh, Sharma, the sharpshooter, Canadian player of the year, national player of the year, who can shoot the eyes out of it. So uh, there, there's still talent in the program, and I, I don't think that the roster is settled by any chance, uh, by any means at this point. But, Comments uh, coming in here for you. But uh, yeah, you know, you know there's, I, I think there's been some damage to the program nationally from uh, the aspect of, of a lack of offensive spark. And a lot of that falls on the Tony Bennett's shoulders. I think he's probably has recognized that. I, I've, I've read that he has mentioned to a couple of high school prospects that he's taking a, a long look at the offense and how to infuse more firepower into it, some, maybe some different schemes. Um, I would never tell Tony Bennett what to do, but but if I were him, I, I would, since he scrimmaged Danny Hurley in Connecticut last year. Maybe Before the season. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think I'd go spend some time with Danny Hurley and just look at what they're doing offensively because I know Hurley, even though they score more than Virginia, they, he, they play at a they don't play at a breakneck speed pace, but Hurley is kind of an offensive genius with some of the sets and, and motions and things that he has put together. And I, I think uh, I think it would be beneficial to, to spend some time with him just to see what they're doing and try to uh, may, maybe bring a little bit that south. Brian Yeagle watching the program. B. Yeagle, uh, good man, knows the uh, Virginia Athletic Department inside and out. A St. Anne's Belfield graduate himself, played college baseball, Brian Yeagle. Um, he has this comment, and I found this curious as well, Brian. He says, fellas, 
thoughts on the current UVA lacrosse player who's switching to basketball and going to Stanford? Do we think Tony Bennett spoke to him at all? I'll relay the news from here. Um, his name is Cole Kastner. Cole Kastner is staying in the Atlantic Coast Conference, switching from lacrosse to basketball. He's a six foot seven All American defenseman, and he said on Wednesday of last week that he would use his final year of eligibility to transfer to Stanford to play basketball for the 2024 2025 season. He was a high school basketball standout in Palo Alto. So a lot of folks are not surprised he's going to Stanford, having grown up there. A three-year starter on the high school basketball team, 17 points, 10 rebounds, three assists, 17 double-doubles his senior year. This guy's an animal, six foot seven, all-American defenseman. I could not imagine being a tackman, seeing a six foot seven guy with yeah. a lacrosse stick in his hands. <laughs> yeah. At you. yeah, I would agree. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if Tony Bennett has spoken to him or not. I would. I would imagine he probably has. Um, I, I just don't know. I, 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 we, once basketball season's over, uh, the media is pretty much cut off from from uh, Tony Bennett and, and some of the programs. So I, we don't have any uh, interview opportunities unless we go out of our way to do it. But uh, there's no mass uh, press conferences or anything like that to where we can ask questions. So I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Renee Pettiford watching the quote, uh, show. She's a diehard UVA fan. A lot of comments coming in here, Hootie. She has this question. If nothing happens in the transfer portal, if we strike out on Trent Perry, is there an opportunity to return Dante Harris and Leon Bond to the program? I don't think so. I think that door is closed. Uh, usually when a guy leaves, there's no coming back, I, particularly here at, at Virginia from what I've seen. I, I think they leave for a reason. I, I don't think that. I think Leon Bond was an odd man out. Um, his jump shooting yeah, ability I agree. was questionable. He was a, 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 a three. He was a guy that probably could have played the two or the three, but he didn't have a jump shot to play either. Uh, athletic, explosive. Six foot five limits you at the three, and his jump shooting keeps him from playing the two. Uh, Dante Harris, curiously, if healthy, and you and I both wondered how much that high ankle sprain lingered and impacted his performance this past year. A healthy Dante Harris, if there's no commitments in the backcourt, perhaps could provide some depth. I agree with you. The likelihood of him returning, though, is slim to none. Yeah, the, the fact that they were... They made it evident that they were looking for another point guard. I'm sure drove him away, and and you know Tony has meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings with these players at the end of the season, and he's realistic with them what his expectations are, and 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 uh, he's honest with them about potential playing time. Um, you talk about a guy that struggled with a jump shot. That that was Dante Harris. His his uh, shooting percentage was woeful. Uh, as was Bonds, and I'm as was Rodies. As was Rodies, and uh, a lot of people were surprised that that he decided to return. Uh, which I imagine he he's going to work hard on his jump shot in the off season and try to improve that. But um, I, I think that that the. The poor shooting um, was one of the ingredients or or whatever that led to Bond and Harris leaving the program. Uh, viewers and listeners, let us know your thoughts. Trent Perry. What, the, the interesting thing about this McDonald's All-America, the Southern California transfer, if he commits to Virginia, and that's a big if, others would follow. He would be a potential... Um, you know, funnel to future talent. Yeah. People want to play with a point guard of this man's caliber. You would think so. He's almost like a, a, a share of the football quarterback. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he, he can score too, but he, he, yeah, he is. He's the kind of guy that can attract other players to your program, uh, particularly out of the portal. Should he make a commitment, it's not too late to, to grab a couple other good guys who can score out of the portal or, or 
uh, some physical guys that can help add to the depth of the front court. So uh, I don't know what he's waiting on. I don't know if he's planning other visits, taking other visits. Um, I would assume that since he uh, was posing for his Virginia pictures while he officially visited here, he was posing with a uh, Happy Meal and some McDonald's fries that there might be some NIL opportunities there that were discussed. Uh, otherwise, I don't know why it would be uh, posing with, with those items. Unless the McDonald's All-American reference. Well, he, yeah, but still, um, uh, yeah, I don't know why you would pose with that. I mean, I, I think your your point is justified in that Kia Clark and Brennan Armstrong had similar opportunities. Right. and um, But, yeah, I mean, uh, if, if he's planning on coming here, he probably needs to go ahead and, and pull the trigger and and do exactly what you mentioned and, and trying to help them lure some other players to Charlottesville because he that's star power and uh, good players want to play with good players. Matt Hines, your question is coming up. It's on deck. I got a very pointed question for Hootie Ratcliffe first. I, I personally believe Tony Bennett walks on water. I'm the first guy that says, look, this guy takes a couple of loaves of bread and a few fishes and feeds the hundreds. Right. And, and, and he should have his name on the court. Um, I always push back when someone says that the game has passed him or he's not adapting his uh, philosophy uh, to today's basketball. I think that's ludicrous. I will ask you this question. The, the brand recognition and the brand equity and the brand appeal that came with the 2019 national championship, that's been chiseled away. And the loss to Colorado State in the play-in game was was even more humiliating because it happened prior to the tournament, which gave the national media even more runway to talk about it because they needed storylines to cover prior to the tournament starting. Here's the point of question. Is the brand that is Virginia basketball as in a challenging position right now as you've seen it in the Tony Bennett era? Yeah, I think you you made up some great points there, and I, I agree with all of them. And... Uh, yes, I think I think the brand has been damaged uh, in their postseason play, and national media kept hammering away at Virginia all all year this past year because uh, the lack of offensive capabilities. And even though that's something that Virginia is not known for, uh, and they they've they've been a low scoring team primarily throughout his tenure here, except for that 2019 team, which scored a lot of points and had a lot of offensive firepower. I think uh, the brand has been tainted a little bit because it came under such criticism from national media. And, and like you said, because it was the first, one of the first games of the entire tournament in the first four, it gave people a lot of latitude to to go after what you know they were saying that Virginia didn't belong in in the tournament to begin with. They some of the media national media called heat from Virginia fans for that, but that was their reply was okay. We told you so, and now we're going to make we're going to make that a solid point. Uh, throughout the tournament and, and they certainly did they hammered away and uh, I think it, it has damaged Virginia's brand uh, to, to the point where I don't think it's ever been under the microscope like it is right now even though some people that know basketball I mean really know basketball who people who have played it at a high level and coached it uh, some of them have told me they thought that this past year was Tony Bennett's best under, coaching year. Yeah, under the circumstances, yeah. was Tony Bennett's best coaching job of his career. And that's where I, I'm on that side of the fence. Yeah, um, third so, place in the regular season, third place in the ACC tournament, a whiskers hair for making the ACC final. 
You make it to the ACC championship. You're probably not in the play-in game. If you're in the ACC championship, I'm talking the tournament here, anything can happen. You catch a break or two. You win the tournament championship. You're seated considerably higher. And then we may not be having this conversation. Yeah, and we might still be. They, they still might have gotten beaten by somebody they shouldn't have. Shouldn't have, but um, it, it, it's it's puzzling to me that that this team it just never lived up to the expectations that people had for it, and, and maybe they had a couple of misses in the portal. Maybe some of these guys just didn't develop the way they expected they would. I'd say I'd say minor. I'd say Rody was potentially a miss. I think there's latitude potentially with. Rody finding confidence in the jump shot. There was flashes of Rody playmaking, court awareness, feel for the game. Uh, toward the end of the season, we started seeing a little pep and a little confidence with his jump shot. We started saying, oh, this guy's long. This guy's tall. This guy's got handles. This guy mm -hmm. can defend on the perimeter. He can pass the ball. But when the jump shot's not working for a guy that's playing the two, you basically sag off this guy who's shooting 20% from downtown or less, yeah. and then you, you, you allocate the attention to, to Beekman or McNeely or, or, or Dunn. And yeah, and Groves was not to, to the same degree as Rudy, but he was hot or cold, and when he was cold... It was ice cold. There was really no other options because, uh, like you said, Dunn was a slasher and a guy who could kill you around the rim, but he couldn't hit a jump shot. And, uh, or at least r rarely did. His shooting percentages were woeful. And um, any good basketball coach will tell you, you know, if all I have to do is stop two guys, I, c I can probably beat you. Uh, but if I have to stop three, it's a whole different equation. And uh, people that have three scores that you can rely on, uh, are really hard to beat. I mean, look at UConn <laughs> if you if you got any questions about that. Uh, Matt Hines watching the program. James Watson, you're on deck. Randy Clark on Hootie's page with a question. Mr. Hines wants to know if um, there are word or scuttlebutt coming to the coaching staff. He says, any word of changes are coming to the staff? Seems like if changes are coming offensively, you might refresh the staff with some new perspectives and skill sets. I, the, he's the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer. I'm just a passionate fan here. Tony, Biggis, Tony Bennett's strength is his loyalty and his commitment to his beliefs, uh, his, his, his beliefs um, faith-wise, basketball philosophy-wise, and loyalty to his staff. One of his biggest strengths here, I wouldn't imagine we'd see anything like this happening, change-wise. I don't think so. I, I mean, I think if we were going to see any change, it would have happened Already, I, I know a lot of people felt like that maybe this was the year if Jason Wilford was going to become a head coach somewhere else that this would have been the year. Especially with the JMU opening. Right, and uh, and that didn't happen. And, of course, Ron Sanchez, th there was a change not that long ago when he rejoined the staff, leaving Charlotte, uh, replacing Kyle Getter. Um so, no, I don't think there's going to be any changes in the staff at this point. Uh, I don't see anybody leaving unless uh, I, I think uh, for Isaiah Wilkins or uh, Johnny Carpenter, I, they're, not, they're not ready to become head coaches anywhere else at this point. I don't know if anybody would be talking to them about joining their staff. But uh, – I, th I think the staff is probably set. Tony's a pretty stubborn guy. I think he, I don't think he likes to change. Um, I, I know there's been some suggestions in the past about trying to uh, change his philosophy and, and taking chances on uh, on some kids that might be a, a, a five star. Or a one and done kind of guy, and he's kind of been against that. He he still believes in the old school philosophy that he learned under his dad that there are no are no shortcuts into building a program. Things have changed a little bit now that uh, college athletics have 
drastically changed in the past 12 to 24 months. Uh, I, I think he's probably uh, it, he's going to have to make some adjustments offensively. Uh, no matter if he gets anybody new in the program at this point or not, I, and I think he probably will get some more players. Uh, it's still early in the portal in, in that respect, but um, uh, he, he's a he's a guy who I, I don't I think he's pretty. Content with his staff, I don't think he uh, is the kind of guy that welcomes a whole wave of changes to things. Uh, I, th I think he will tweak the offense and look at ways to make it more efficient. But I, I don't think we're going to see a great overhaul of Virginia basketball in, in any aspect. Uh, Randy wants to know on your Facebook page how the NIL stacks up in the ACC, UVA's. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that because none of, none of these schools uh, have to. And he's watching in Gilbert, Arizona. Wow! Thank, thank you so much. We thanks for welcoming us into your home. Uh, uh, that information just isn't available. Uh, the schools don't have to publicize or 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 even. Uh, divulge what their NIL programs are. Which is frustrating. It, it's very frustrating because, you know, you're going in blind if you're another program. You don't know what you're up against. You, all you hear is rumors. And um, I've talked to some coaches, and, and they sometimes will be told by rival coaches what their particular NIL numbers are. And, and I guess those numbers are changing at all all the time at, at every school, really, because people are still trying to catch up with with uh, who who's got what and is this good enough? Or, you know, are we having some shortcomings here? Or are we? Uh, does our cup runneth over? I, I don't think anybody. Uh, I don't think anybody knows what. Every school in the ACC's NIL numbers are. I, I don't think that information is, and I don't know if it'll ever be available because it, it doesn't have to be unless a school volunteers it. And I don't see any school doing that and unless they're made to by uh, law or or some other method where they're they have to do so. Who are the top NIL, um, you know? momentum drivers or forces or brands behind it. I mean, one of them you work closely with um, in the Good Feet store. Yeah. I, I McDonald's think, is another one. Right. The local franchise owners. Yeah. I, I think uh, Roback, uh, another one of my sponsors, I think they produce some NIL money for the program. Um I've I've heard of some others that do so, but I don't know to what degree. But uh, I do know that more NIL money has poured into the program, and I think a lot of it came out of frustration. And I, I think a lot of it was spurned by that dark day in November when Virginia Tech just beat the living daylights out of Virginia on the football field. And uh, I think it was such an embarrassing, humiliating loss that – some people just couldn't take it anymore, and they said, we're, we're not going to let this happen again, and if it takes giving NIL money, then that's what we'll do. But I, I think there are so many sources uh, of NIL, uh, there, there's no way to tell exactly uh, unless those people make it public, publicly known, like some of the companies we have mentioned. Uh, there's there's no way of telling unless you just hear it through the grapevine. James Watson, we appreciate you watching the shows. He's a diehard Virginia fan. He's watching the program. Viewers and listeners, let us know your thoughts. We'll relay them live on air. We're talking basketball. We got to talk football. We got to talk Malik Washington. And of course, we got baseball and lacrosse to talk about. Lacrosse ACC tournament semifinals um, this weekend. I believe it's Friday. I'll check the schedule here in a matter of moments against Notre Dame, a repeat or a rematch against Notre Dame. That storyline coming up. Malik Washington, six-round pick Miami Dolphins. 
Yeah, um, I was disappointed that he was taken that late. Me too. I, I thought he would go. I thought he'd be up around in the 90s or or at least 120 something. But uh, he was picked later than that. Um, I think the Dolphins got a steal. Got a steal. I think he's a guy that can help them in the slot from the get go, and I think that's. I saw the video of Mike McDaniel when uh, when they he he knew that. Washington was secured, and they they had the pick, and he did a fist pump. He did a fist pump, and a, a he was very excited that they got him. And they said they got him because they knew he's the kind of guy that would would not shy away from the competition in that receivers room, and that he would be a guy that would uh, give it his all. And and he's exactly right. Malik Washington is one heck of a competitor, and. Uh, he's a very intelligent guy. I mean, he was all academic Big Ten, all academic ACC. He's so well spoken, so well put together, so well organized. Um, I'll never forget Tony Yelley talked about when they went to visit him. Uh, I guess at his apartment in in Chicago when he was in the portal, and they got to his apartment and everything in the apartment was like perfect like a uh, molly maid had been there for a month <laughs> but it was just malik washington he's that organized that uh, put well put together and that's the way his entire life is and the guys uh, uh what surprised me that uh, you know i know his size probably hurt him a little bit and he's not the fastest guy in the world, he'll tell you that, but he has so many other assets that one of the things I know the Dolphins liked about him was his yards after catch, and that's one of his strengths. Uh, he runs like a running back, not like a wide receiver. So uh, we've talked about that many times on this program, but I, you know, the, I can't believe that NFL teams saw didn't see that he put up those kind of numbers week after week when opposing defenses, uh, you know, we would hear on the ACC teleconference or other press conferences throughout the week that in advance that uh, other coaches saying, well, we've got a hand, we got to know where he is all the time. We can't let him beat us. So he was one of the top targets in, in every defensive game plan he faced this year, and yet he still put up over 100 yards a game almost every week and uh, did it with chiefly with a freshman quarterback. And uh, I, I'm just – I was so impressed with the year he had. It's, it's one of the best years I've ever seen a guy have. And, and I, the fact that other NFL teams didn't recognize that is – a surprise to me, and I, that's why I think the Dolphins uh, and, and McDaniel's is is known as sort of an offensive genius in some of the schemes he runs. Not only throwing plays, but running plays. But uh, he, he's at another level in terms of offensive uh, scheming. I, I think he knows that Malik Washington is a guy that's going to fit right into that offense and make a difference uh they need a third receiving option yep the miami dolphins tua does a great job of spreading the football around they obviously have arguably the most explosive playmaker at their number one option the miami dolphins are you a, no you're a 49ers fan is someone in your family a dolphins fan no no what's what is scott steelers a hey, steelers yeah Scott's a steelers fan. so this is a good spot potentially for malik washington a couple of uh measurables i want to highlight a 42 and a half inch vertical. Mm -hmm. Five foot eight does not worry me at all when he plays in the slot. There's been plenty of five eight, five nine guys. Wes Walker's a, a perfect example. Absolutely. A little bit of the speed at four four seven may be question mark, but when you're playing in the slot, more about quickness than speed. And Washington's got the quickness and the hands to match. I love this for Malik Washington. And it would be a great opportunity for Virginia football to have a guy like this make a roster and perform for uh, future recruitment opportunities. And speaking of recruiting, 
Where do you want to begin with Tony Elliott and what he's doing in the offseason? Well, you know, I think overall they've done a pretty good job putting together the next recruiting class. I think overall they have 11 commitments at this point. I think uh, it, it seems to be a little higher caliber of recruit for the most part. There are a couple of guys on there that raises eyebrows. How do you say is it? How do you say his first name? X A Y. I think Zay. Zay Davis is who Hootie is referencing, and he's doing it in very kind <laughs> fashion. Hootie is one that is a kind man here. This guy is not re- not rated by any recruiting service. True, he, he's a running back and um, out of Richmond, and uh, his list of schools are. Not going to blow you away. Coastal Carolina is really the only one that that. Uh, what is that? The Chanticleers. The Chanticleers. Yeah. Yes. What is the Chanticleer? It's a it's a rooster. Oh, it's a rooster. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And it'll claw your eyes out. Okay, it'll claw your <laughs> eyes out. Okay, I learned something today here from Moody. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, there, there's a couple guys like that on 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 the list of the eleven that uh, aren't that highly ranked. Or ranked at all, but I, I generally, um, there, some of these guys are, have a pretty nice profile. And uh, one of them I was looking at, one of the most recent recruits, um, yeah, the uh, Justin Rowe kid out of Asheville, North Carolina. Um, yeah. He picked Virginia over some pretty good schools. I mean, he was offered by Michigan, Missouri, NC State, SMU, Tennessee, Virginia Tech, North Carolina, Boston College, South Carolina, and Wake Forest. Um, that's a pretty impressive list. and uh, He's mostly recruited as a linebacker, although he's a versatile kid. He can probably play in the nickel and uh, as a safety and, and some other uh, spots they c- could possibly move around in. But uh, the, they have several guys on this list that have been pursued by some pretty good football programs. And so I think overall the next class will be his best class and and, and, and a pretty, pretty decent class. Um, there's still not a lot of guys from the state of Virginia, but you know they're not done yet. They can still probably sign uh, at least double what double the commitments they have now. But uh, he's got an uphill battle. Uh, you know, not not a lot of people want to come to a program that's winning three games a year, and it's. Um, uh, the unfortunate aspect right now, and this could be a lead storyline for a commentary piece or a talk show like this, and Rob Neal's making a joke here. He's a diehard JMU football fan, uh, JMU sports fan across the board, and he calls the Chanticleers beach chickens for the <laughs> JMU Dukes. Rob Neal, you got a chuckle out of both of us here. That's uh, I like that. That's a good one. The, the storyline is the, the current – brand equity of both basketball and football right now, they seem to be on a similar trajectory. And that trajectory is one of um, rebuilding um, and one of, of, of folks trying to negatively recruit against them and utilizing past performance over the last couple of years um, to do so. This is something I learned from jerryratcliffe.com. I'm on the website every day, literally, and it's not just because the man is sitting across from me. There's a bang-up job with this program. This Davis kid out of the collegiate school, the six-foot, 185-pound running back from Richmond, he's got no stars. He's unranked in the recruiting services. He's the only running back committed for the class of 2025. Yeah, and, and um, the that's kind of a surprise because they're shy at that position right, right. now. Right, right. And... Uh, Kobe Pace is in his, I think, his last year of eligibility. So uh, I think there's only two guys behind him in the program that are running backs. Um, Noah, uh, who 
had a pretty good spring game. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, that's something that's going to come under the microscope. I don't know if they're looking in the portal to find somebody or not. Uh, there's some – now that spring football is over, the portal opened up again for football, and uh, I see guys – going into the portal every day. So they, they may be looking to see what's out there. But I, I think I think uh, Tony Elliott has figured out that, you know, he can recruit 23 stars every year. And if they can develop these guys, uh, they can win. Uh you don't have to have four stars and five stars to, to have a winning program. I, Wake Forest proved that to us long ago when Jim Grobes, uh, a, a Virginia alumni, was there as their head coach and won the ACC and went to the Orange Bowl with nobody higher than a two-star on his roster. Uh, there, are, there are programs out there who can, who are not only surviving but flourishing with three stars. Uh, Virginia is, you know, unless something drastically changes, Virginia's not going to compete for the ACC championship anytime soon. Uh, and they don't have to. They they need to consistently win six or seven games a year, get into a bowl game. Every four to five years, maybe assemble a roster that's good enough to win – Nine games, flirt with ten, be in the conversation for an ACC championship appearance. Um, but they have to be smart about it. And in, in terms of scheduling, I don't think they're doing a very good job of that right now. They just announced this past week that they're going to play Washington State next year, which or uh, in 25, I guess, or 26, whatever it was. I think it was 25. I I don't think that's a very intelligent move. I agree. I think you should be looking for the worst teams in Division One football and, and try to build some confidence and get some winning seasons into your, in your, in your background so you can – Get the uh, even if it's a crummy bowl game. Players want to go to bowl games. I, you got to win, the, you know, six games. And if you keep taking on programs that you're even with or behind, it's awfully hard to do. And I just don't think they've learned that lesson yet. Virginia football guys has got a uh, rubber meets the road type of season ahead, and time's going to tell what happens with Tony Elliott and this ball club. We gotta talk baseball, we gotta talk lacrosse. Baseball is second in the Coastal Division behind North Carolina. It's a talented roster. North Carolina is loaded. Uh, and Virginia won that series against the Virginia Tar Heels. Virginia took two or three against the Tar Heels. Yeah. Two or three against UNC. Um, where do you wanna begin? Baseball, lacrosse, spring sports, anything else, news and notes, not even tied to these programs that you wanna cover? Well, I, I don't understand why the ACC has a lacrosse tournament. I mean, there's it's just four teams that they're going to play. And, and you end up playing – they're going to end up playing Notre Dame for the second time in, in a very short span. Playing and, Notre Dame back-to-back. Yeah, and, and yeah. Could, could end up playing three times like they did last year. Yeah. Uh, I, to me, that's just too redundant. I, I I don't. I don't think it's necessary. I, and maybe, I, maybe they have to do that to have games and ex, extend their season. Or maybe there's just not enough teams around. I don't know. But I, I, it just doesn't make sense to me why they have a tournament. But uh, it does give them a chance to avenge that loss in, in the last game, which I thought they would win. But. Uh, they they kind of fell apart at the end, but uh, this, like you mentioned earlier, I, I think this roster is loaded enough. They could still end up winning the national championship. 100%. There's no question about it. Hundred percent. They just need to get on a roll, and uh, they're very capable. Virginia's on a three-game losing streak right now. They're ten and four overall, one and three in conference play. 
Notre Dame is the creme de la creme, at least at this point, eight-game winning streak, 10-1 and overall, 4-0 and in conference play, Syracuse, Duke, and then UNC in the cellar. Um, ACC tournament underway Friday, 5 o'clock Charlotte, with the Fighting Irish um, as a favorite on paper, but anything can happen. And then the NCAA first round, the tournament, the NCAA dance, starts the 11th of May, which is a Saturday. Any baseball you want to cover? Anything else out of the notebook you want to get to? Well, you know, it's another banner year for Brian O'Connor. He's amazing. Program. Uh, yeah. he, you, you can never count those guys out of Omaha. I don't care what the scenario is. We've seen them pull off so many incredible finishes in recent years. Uh, sometimes it takes – the postseason to bring out the best in his program. And uh, the, the fact that they're leading the country or number two in the country in almost every offensive category that means anything is certainly a feather in their caps. The pitching's struggling a little bit, and that seems to be the one thing that, that is holding them back. And uh, it's the one thing that kind of hurt them last year when they got to Omaha. They they say good pitching beats good hitting, and they ran into nothing but good pitching in, in the College World Series, and it shut down Virginia's best hitters. So that that's something that has to be a concern, I think, uh, once we start talking postseason baseball. But uh, they're ranked uh, ninth, 10th, 11th in the country in, in almost every – Poll that matters. So their offensive production is off the charts. I think. I think the one thing they're concerned about now is whether they'll be able to host a regional or not. Which I, it would be nice if they can because it means a lot to the program and it means a lot to the town. It means a lot to the community. It means yeah. a lot to the uh, award-winning journalists that cover the the team, especially in the spring. Yeah, it's uh, something nice, a nice diversion. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, what's in the hopper at jerryratcliffe.com? Well, we'll... Uh, God, I hope uh, it's Trent Perry. I, I, I mean, we, it's, it, we constantly scan um, Twitter and the Internet and everything to find any bit of news we can about the transfer portal and, and the high school recruiting, uh, especially when it comes to Trent Perry, as you mentioned, uh, he's on the other side of the country, and it's there's scarce news about this kid. Uh, I don't know if uh, nobody out there cares because he's not looking. I guess he's not looking at Southern Cal anymore. I would think if he was interested in Eric Musselman's program, he would have made a move by now. So. Uh, but there's very little coming out about him, and uh, it's it's hard to find out much information about um, the conversations going on between Virginia and some of the players they've reached out to in the portal. So you got to be Johnny on the spot and watch out for that. It can happen uh, any time of the day, any day of the week. Uh, but that and uh, uh, we'll be looking hard at uh, lacrosse and baseball for sure. Uh, as we go forward, and uh, certainly the tennis program is doing well, and uh, who knows what they might be able to pull off. I mean, off. you could be looking at multiple national champions in the last championships in the next 30 days. Could, could possibly. Which, which, which says a lot about the depth in this athletic department. His name is Jerry Hootie Ratcliffe. He's the star of the show. He's the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, the namesake of jerryratcliffe.com. If you want anything UVA-related, you find it at jerryratcliffe.com. They do award-winning work there. Mr. Consistency, Mr. MVP, Judah Wickhauer behind the camera. He's the man. He is the man. My name is Jerry Miller, and it's the Jerry and Jerry Show, uh, which airs Tuesdays, um, wherever you get your social media and podcasting content. Thank you kindly for joining us, and so long, everybody. Thank you, sir. Same to you.